Hello there. My name's John Price, and this is a short video on how to be a good bridge partner. Now, I hope you will take my advice in the right spirit. I've met a number of bridge players, many good, some brilliant bridge players, who could have been so much better if they'd learned that bridge was a partnership game. For them, bridge is a brilliant game, spoiled only by the idiot sitting opposite them on a card table. I'm going to give you now four bits of advice that might prove so important to you in your bridge development. Here are my thoughts on how to be a good bridge partner. Firstly, I'd like to say that you, you should never attempt to teach your partner during a duplicate bridge session. I put the word teach in inverted commas, because in fact, you just do not have the time to teach in a duplicate bridge session. Let me explain. If you try to teach a, a young child the idea of the, the word red, then you'd say, this ball is red. That train is red. That bicycle is red. Do you see what I'm saying? Oh, look at that brick. That isn't red. That's green. Look at this hat. No, it's not red. It's blue. Oh, now look at your teddy. Now, you might think that's red, but we call that pink. It's not quite red. Do you see the idea? Teaching at all levels follows these simple ideas. You give lots of examples where something does work, but more important, just as important, some examples where it doesn't work. And then some odd examples which are close either way. Yes, you should lead diamonds here. Yes, you should lead diamonds with this hand too. But you wouldn't lead diamonds in this hand. Do you see why? And look at this hand. Now that's a difficult decision. You could go for diamonds here, but I wouldn't for this reason. It takes a while and you just do not have the time to go through that process when you're playing in a duplicate bridge session. So don't attempt it, nor be tempted to think, but what about those couple of minutes at the end of a round when you're waiting for other people to finish? That's an opportunity then to do a bit of teaching with your partner. I've got the time then. Don't attempt it then either. If you start teaching your partner at that point, then the opposition would have to sit there and have to listen to it. They can't even talk to each other because you are talking to your partner. That's a time of involving everybody in a conversation, not you and your partner dominating it. So don't teach your partner. And what if your partner attempts to teach you? Ah, oh, tricky. Here's my suggestion. When your partner wants to teach you, you say, I'm sorry, but I'd like to concentrate on the next hand. Uh, can we talk about it at the end of the session? I'll make a note of that hand. And you write down on a piece of paper the number of that hand. If it happens again in the session, you say exactly the same thing and write that down. If that list during the session grows any bigger than 10, possibly your partner at that point will understand that something's wrong here, and you will have decided at that point you are never going to play with this partner again. My next piece of advice is to forget a hand of bridge as soon as it's finished. Your job is to concentrate on the next hand, not dwell on the hand that you just played. You will be a good partner if when you make a mistake in a particular bridge hand, not to dwell on it, but to 
forget that and then concentrate on the next hand. That's your job. Later on, you want to pause, perhaps make a note of, I must remember what doing a transfer actually means because you've made that mistake. But don't dwell on it. Have you realized that once you play a hand of bridge, you will never, ever play that hand again? There are so many possible hands of bridge. So just forget that. And also, make sure that your partner forgets an awful mistake. Don't make them remember. Don't dwell on it. Because they should be concentrating on the next hand. So don't play your part in putting them off. Making them think about a, a previous hand when they're supposed to be concentrating on the next hand. Next, I want to suggest that you praise good play of your partner and also that of the opposition when you see it. Though, don't get over-enthusiastic about this. Just a simple good play partner or good play opposition is enough. Now, you might be surprised that I'm suggesting that you praise the opposition as well as your partner. Why would you do that? They are the opposition. They're the enemy. Think about it. Let's say you're playing north-south and the east-west opposition are playing you certainly are the opposition for that round only. But then they'll move on. Your real opposition is actually all the other north-south pairs. You want your opposition to play pretty badly while they're playing with you. But then, when they go on, you want me to be playing brilliantly against all the other North-South pairs. And you'll get them to do that if you get them to leave feeling good about themselves. That's good play. It's good tactics. But it's also good for your partnership. Your partner feels that they are being rewarded. We do respond to praise in all contexts, particularly in bridge. My final bit of advice, possibly the most important, is to never, ever criticise the bidding or play of your partner, nor of that of the opposition. It's actually bad for your bridge score. Now, it's actually quite rare for any bridge player to admit that they criticise their partner. They are teaching their partner. And they have to do that because in what way will they learn otherwise? Well, we've dealt with that. They are definitely not doing any teaching. They are criticising. And when people are criticised, they take that on board and they think about it and they feel bad about it and they're dwelling on that when they, your partner should not be dwelling on the previous hand. They should be thinking with positivity about the next hand. If there's something that's happened that you're disapproving of about a play or a bidding, then just make a quiet note about it. And then you can talk about that with your partner afterwards. There's loads of opportunity, especially now with the uh, technology that we have. It's easy to look back on old hands to see the play. You could have played it all over again. You could discuss that. You can talk about it. But not during the play do you ever criticise your partner. And you don't do that of the opposition either. You might think it's fun just to point out that, oh, the two of spades was a, a winner, actually. If you played that, then you would have got your three no trumps. That might be good for your ego to show the opposition and your partner what a brilliant bridge player you are to have noted that. But you send your opposition away feeling bad about themselves. And as I've said before, they need to be in good shape to go off and beat all the other 
North South South pairs that you are really competing against. So it's bad for your score. But it's also bad for finding a good partner. Because people will remember the way you behaved with your partner or with themselves. And they'll think, there's no way that I want to play with that guy. So that's quite often why people find it surprisingly difficult to find a good partner. Maybe they are the cause of that difficulty. In summary, if you have been lucky enough to find a bridge player that you enjoy playing with, then believe me, you have been given a precious gift. And I suggest you treasure and protect that wonderful gift. And maybe you'll find that gift by being a good partner to all the different people that you end up playing with. Sometimes you don't have a regular partner and you're playing with lots of different people. Then with every one of them, you play to the best of your ability as being a good partner. If you do, then one of those may be just that gift that you're looking for, the good bridge partner. Thank you for listening.